Richlin Airfield, Germany, March 1943. Snow drifts across the cracked concrete as the hangar doors groan open. Inside, a captured B-24 Liberator looms under harsh floodlights, its silver skin dulled by smoke, its nose art half-torn, the smell of burnt oil and cold metal heavy in the air. German mechanics in gray overalls circle the giant aircraft in silence. One man traces a gloved hand across the riveted fuselage, whispering that no bomber this large should have survived a crash. Engineers unbolt a wing panel, revealing neatly rooted cables, labeled conduits, and a jungle of precision wiring. A senior Luftwaffe officer writes in his logbook, This is not a bomber. This is industry with wings. The discovery would soon shatter every assumption Germany held about American engineering. By early 1943, the air war over Europe had become a battle of endurance. The Royal Air Force struck German cities under cover of darkness, while by day, the U.S. 8th Air Force flew vast formations of heavy bombers from airfields across England. Their mission was precise and relentless, destroy German industry from the sky. Two aircraft led that campaign, the B-17 Flying Fortress and its larger, longer-legged counterpart, the B-24 Liberator. Built by Consolidated Aircraft and produced under license by Ford, Douglas, and North American Aviation, the Liberator embodied the American philosophy of total war production. It could fly faster than the B-17, carry heavier bomb loads, and reach targets as far as Ploiesti, Romania, and the Ruhr Valley, where Germany's industrial heart beat. While Luftwaffe interceptors tangled daily with B-17s, the B-24 remained a mystery to German intelligence. Its unusual high-mounted, shoulder-wing and twin-tail design made it instantly recognizable in the sky, but little was known about how it was built or how it survived such punishment. That changed on a cold winter morning in occupied France when anti-aircraft fire crippled a returning American bomber. The pilot, losing altitude, made an emergency landing in a muddy field near Saint-Nazaire. The crew was captured within hours, but the aircraft, largely intact, would prove far more valuable than its men. Within days, a recovery convoy was on its way to transport the prize north. The Luftwaffe was about to meet America's flying factory. The captured Liberator, its engine splattered with mud, but its frame miraculously unbroken, was dismantled in the field under tight Wehrmacht supervision. German engineers carefully tagged every component, photographing bullet holes and stress fractures. The aircraft was designated a Technisch Butte, a technical trophy, and loaded onto flatbed trucks bound for Richlin Lehrs airfield, the Luftwaffe's secret test and evaluation center northeast of Berlin. Richlin was where the Reich learned the minds of its enemies. Within its hangars, captured Spitfires, Mustangs, and flying fortresses were dissected, measured, and flown to expose every possible secret. But nothing had prepared the engineers for what they found inside the B-24. When the aircraft was reassembled, its sheer scale dwarfed every German bomber parked beside it. The four Pratt and Whitney R-1830 twin WASP engines, each delivering 1,200 horsepower, sat under cowlings that opened with mechanical precision. The internal bomb racks, modular wiring looms, and prefabricated sections stunned technicians used to the handcrafted nature of German designs like the Heinkel He-111 or Junkers Ju-88. As inspection teams removed the skin panels, they discovered an aircraft seemingly built not by craftsmen, but by machines. Rivets were identical, components perfectly interchangeable, and electrical systems labeled for quick replacement. Each section bore stamped serial codes, standardized to fit any liberator from any factory line. One officer, after studying the markings, realized the implications. This bomber had not been built by artisans, but by thousands of semi-skilled workers across an entire nation. The teardown began the following morning, and with it, a revelation that would shake German confidence in their own industry. The first shock came not from what the Germans found broken, but from what they found perfect. 
Each panel removed from the B-24 revealed an orderliness that seemed impossible under wartime production pressure. Wires were bundled with standardized clamps, instruments mounted with identical bolts, and hydraulic lines bent to precise factory curves. This, one Richlin engineer remarked, was built like an automobile. He wasn't far from the truth. Across the Atlantic, Ford's Willow Run plant in Michigan was producing one liberator every hour using automotive-style assembly lines, a concept almost alien to the Luftwaffe's culture of precision craftsmanship. German bombers like the He-111 or Ju-88 were built by skilled hands fitting parts by eye. Each aircraft had personality, quirks, adjustments, but the B-24 was pure system, identical parts built by thousands of semi-skilled workers who had never even seen a bomber fly. When mechanics examined the wings, they noticed modular joints that allowed subassemblies from different factories to fit with surgical precision. The spars were straight, efficient, built for mass manufacture rather than elegance. To German eyes accustomed to the curved artistry of aircraft like the FW-200 Condor, the B-24 looked crude, until they realized its strength lay not in aesthetics but engineering economy. Even the Davis wing, with its narrow profile and high lift-to-drag ratio, reflected a ruthless pursuit of efficiency. It allowed the bomber to cruise faster and farther on less fuel an invisible advantage that extended American reach deep into occupied Europe. By the second day of inspection, a quiet unease settled among the mechanics. The B-24 was not beautiful, but it was logical. Every detail spoke of a nation that had industrialized warfare itself. As the teardown continued, the Luftwaffe's technical officers began examining the B-24 from a combat perspective, and what they found was even more unsettling. The bomber's internal layout demonstrated brutal efficiency. Its bomb bay doors were thin, spring-loaded aluminum panels that snapped open and shut hydraulically in seconds. There were no heavy mechanical cranks or chains. The fuel tanks, self-sealing and protected by rubberized layers, connected through a maze of transfer lines that allowed balance adjustment mid-flight. German engineers marveled at the redundancy. If one system failed, another automatically took over. The defensive positions told their own story. The consolidated A6 tail turret, the Emerson nose turret, and the twin .50 caliber waste guns gave the Liberator an all-around field of fire that rivaled the B-17s. When one German gunner climbed into the tail position, he remarked, you could fight a small war from back here. But it wasn't only weaponry that impressed them. The electrical systems, protected by resettable circuit breakers instead of replaceable fuses, showed an understanding of battlefield maintenance unknown to most Luftwaffe designs. Every instrument was labeled in plain English with embossed metal tags, a maintenance dream for mechanics in muddy forward airfields. To the German engineers, this bomber represented not just American ingenuity, but American philosophy. It was a machine built for endless replication, built to be repaired by anyone, anywhere, in any condition. By the end of the week, the aircraft's skeleton lay bare under the Richlin lights. Panels, pistons, and wires filled labeled crates along the hangar wall. A young technician summed up what everyone felt. They build war the way we build watches, beautiful, but one at a time. They build it like bread by the thousands. By late March 1943, the dismantled Liberator had been restored to flight condition under German supervision. Its olive drab paint had been stripped and replaced with black crosses and swastika markings, while the serial 4124047 still lingered faintly beneath the new Luftwaffe codes. The bomber's engines coughed to life for the first time under German control, echoing across the airfield with a deep, confident hum unlike any Heinkel or Junkers machine. Test pilot Hans Werner Lurch, known for flying captured Allied aircraft, climbed into the cockpit with a small crew of engineers. His first note after takeoff read simply, It flies like a machine that knows its job. 
At 10,000 feet, the Liberator's Davis wing showed its worth. The aircraft cruised steadily, holding altitude with minimal trim adjustments. German data officers recorded its performance, range, fuel efficiency, handling under asymmetric power, and each number told the same story. This bomber was built for war on an industrial scale. The flight confirmed what engineers had already suspected. The Liberator could climb faster and carry a heavier payload than most German twin-engine bombers. Its four radial engines ran smoothly even under heavy stress, something the Luftwaffe's complex inline engines rarely achieved after prolonged use. When Lurch tested single-engine operation, the aircraft remained controllable, astonishing for a 25-ton machine. He later wrote that no German bomber he had flown could have survived such a test. Back on the ground, technicians crowded around the flight logs. Every column of data, speed, range, endurance, proved that the Americans had achieved something the Reich never could, mass-produced power with mechanical reliability. The question now was no longer, how does it work? But how many of these can they build? Within weeks, Richlin's analysis reports reached Berlin. What they contained was a quiet catastrophe for German planners. The data showed that the B-24's operational range exceeded 2,000 miles, allowing strikes on oil fields, submarine pens, and industrial centers deep inside occupied Europe, targets once thought untouchable. Its cruising speed of nearly 290 miles per hour meant German interceptors had only minutes to climb and engage. When engineers compared the B-24's production data, they were stunned. Intelligence reports from neutral countries confirmed that Ford's Willow-run plant in Michigan could produce one aircraft every hour. Germany's most advanced facilities, working under bombing raids and material shortages, needed weeks to build a single Heinkel or Dornier. A report circulated among Luftwaffe officers summarized it bluntly. The enemy builds machines as though they were bullets. We build them as though they were violins. The numbers were merciless. By the time Germany finished assembling 10 He 111s, America had produced hundreds of liberators, each identical, each ready for combat. The psychological blow was immense. For every bomber shot down over Bremen or Kiel, ten more took its place. At Richlin, the engineers who had once admired their nation's craftsmanship now looked at the liberator with reluctant awe. Its design wasn't artful, it was unstoppable. Every standardized bolt, every replaceable module represented a concept Germany could not duplicate. Industrial democracy, a system where thousands of workers could build machines of war as easily as cars. When Lurch's test team finished their final flight series, the logs were sealed with a simple note. No tactical weakness detected, only strategic hopelessness. The Luftwaffe had learned everything about the Liberator's engineering, except how to compete with it. By summer 1943, the captured B-24 had become one of the Luftwaffe's most studied aircraft. Engineers dissected it to the last rivet, drafting manuals that circulated among design bureaus in Berlin and Augsburg. Fighter squadrons received tactical bulletins explaining how to approach Liberator formations, from below, never from behind. Yet beneath the technical language, a darker realization spread through every briefing room. Germany's finest minds now understood that the Allies were fighting a different kind of war, one measured not in skill, but in scale. While Messerschmitt struggled to deliver replacement fighters, Allied assembly lines never paused. The same bomber they studied in Richlin flew overhead weeks later in formations of hundreds, escorted by sleek Mustangs that stretched the horizon. The mechanics who once touched the captured Liberator's aluminum skin now watched identical aircraft drop bombs on the factories that had built their own careers. It was as if the machine they had admired had multiplied overnight and turned against them. By 1944, Germany's industrial cities burned nightly beneath the very bombers whose engineering they had once admired up close. The B-24s came in endless streams over the Ruhr, over Hamburg, over Ploiesti, each wave replacing the one before it. 
The men at Richlin no longer needed test data to understand what they were facing. They could hear it in the sky. Many of the technicians who had studied the captured Liberator were reassigned to damage assessment units. They stood in smoking craters where assembly lines once hummed, realizing the symmetry of fate. The same hydraulics they had praised for precision now opened the bomb bay doors that erased their factories. When the Americans finally reached Berlin in 1945, fragments of the disassembled B-24 still lay in storage crates at Richlin, ribs, engines, data sheets, and a single logbook bearing Lurch's final note. The machine is perfect. The problem is us. Germany had learned from the Liberator how America fought its wars, not with mystery, but with math. In the quiet years that followed, the lessons of that captured Liberator outlived the war itself. What the Luftwaffe discovered inside its aluminum frame was not just engineering excellence, it was a philosophy. Every interchangeable part, every standardized bolt, every redundant system spoke of a nation that had turned organization into a weapon. The B-24 was not built to inspire awe, it was built to endure. It represented a truth the Luftwaffe had been too proud to accept, that wars in the modern age were no longer won by individual brilliance or heroic design, but by factories, logistics, and the disciplined rhythm of production lines. When historians later examined Richlin's reports, they found a single phrase repeated across pages of technical data, industrial warfare perfected. It was not a compliment, it was a eulogy. In the end, the men who once marveled at the captured bomber understood what they had truly seen that winter of 1943. They had not dismantled a machine. They had dismantled the future and realized it already belonged to someone else.